uh, who also happens to be a programmer. Uh, Chris, you've been uh, programming since 1998. 19... I have notes here, but yeah, late 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, so I was yeah, very, 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 very young at that time. <laughs> um, and you're also responsible for True North PHP. Correct. And if, if, if anybody's ever seen those, uh, the woolly mammoth PHP, the woolly mammoth elephants on Twitter, that's because of me. Yeah. I would like one. I'll please. send you one. <laughs> um, and also, oh, not also, but well, it is also, you are working for Mozilla right now. Yes, uh, I work as a QA engineer um, for Mozilla. I just started there, so I want to thank Mozilla for allowing me to fly 27 hours from the snowy wilds of Canada to come here to speak to you guys. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, your the video. you just what's that? Sorry, the where's clicker. The, no, no, no. Where's the cable thing? I can use that one. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so uh, you're going to be taking us thank through uh, making sure that we're, you know, uh, if improving the way we write tests, because at the end of the day, tests are code. So, um, yeah, I'll let you have it, mate. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's just wait for this to come up. Oh, there we go. Okay, so, uh, thanks, Ben, for the intro. So, yeah, so a little bit about myself. So, this talk is about grumpy testing patterns. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a long time, as you mentioned, long time PHP developer, uh, since the PHP 3 days. Um, and I got into testing very, very early, 2004. So this is before PHP Unit had any kind of real solid um, release. I worked on a project that was a complete disaster. Um, and in the aftermath of it, the project manager said to me, uh, you know, Chris, here's a book. I think you should read this book. It'd be kind of interesting. And it was one of Kent Beck's very early, like extreme programming explained or extreme programming by example, something like that. Uh, and I read the section on unit testing, and uh, uh, I curse a lot, so I'm going to try not to swear while I do this too, even though Australia seems to be very open about swearing, which is good for me. Um, I was like, holy crap, this is like exactly what I was looking for, a programmatic way to um, prove that our stuff works and that we could stop using our, uh, our clients as beta testers. So I got into that stuff. So this is like about, yeah, about 2003, 2004. And, uh, you will probably never, ever meet anyone as passionate and opinionated about testing as me. I am so passionate about it. This is my car. <laughs> my beautiful little BMW. Thank you. Uh, with custom license plates. And somebody asked me one time when they saw this picture, what's up with the glove at the bottom? I said, that's someone who didn't test. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to warn you, so being Canadian, I may use some like weird Canadian idioms and speech patterns, so if I say something really weird, I don't say A, I don't say a boot, I don't do all those sort of things, but, um, and I have a lot of slides to go through, so I'll be happy to discuss things with people afterwards, and if I rip through the slides in enough time, we should be okay. Yeah. So let's talk about, first thing of course, warning, personal opinions ahead, um, I'm the father of two girls aged 16 and 11, so it's a very interesting time at my house. And I always warn them all the time about substituting opinions for fact. So, uh, you know, there, there is a talk, I don't, I think other than maybe like Vim versus Emacs or tabs versus spaces, there's not an argument more polarizing than uh, advocating for tests. So be aware that a lot of these are my opinions. Some of them are probably facts, but they're opinions. So, but more importantly, um, this talk isn't about shaming people. Uh, testing is not easy. Uh, I could probably talk, I could probably do this talk in like about three hours. I did a workshop yesterday. I ran out of time because there's so much to cover. So, you know, if you're watching this and you don't actually actively write tests, don't feel bad. Um, I would like it for you, you know, for you to write tests, but you shouldn't feel shame. You shouldn't sit here and watch all these things and think, you know, Jesus Christ, why can't I get into testing? Like, it'll come. It takes time. It takes a lot of effort. I've been at it for 13 years. Still, still a lot to learn. Still a lot of ways that I can get better. Uh, but testing itself has been around almost as long as computer science itself. Uh, it actually predates the rise of the internet. And you know, here's something interesting. This is a, a book, uh, a friend of mine uh, who works for Apple, uh, he said uh, I should check out a copy of this book. It's by an author named Boris uh, Beiser. Uh, this is the edition from 1990. The, the initial edition of this is from 1982. So that's, I'm an old guy, I'm 45. So this book is 30, do the math in my head, old guy. I'm not as jet lagged as Jessica. I'm still full of energy, so I can think. So this is 34 years old, right? If you think about that, the author probably took him a couple years to uh, collect all this information. So, 
you could say almost 40 years that we've had like official definitions of how to test. Yet the special snowflakes that make up the computer industry still act like testing is weird and no one's ever done it and these are all new techniques waiting to be discovered. No, I'm sorry, they're not. If you can find this book, I had to buy a used copy because clearly there are no new ones. Almost everything that I need to do, both in my old job where I spent a lot of time writing PHP code and doing unit tests, and in my new job at Mozilla where I spent a lot of time writing Python tests against API endpoints and verifying that Firefox doesn't blow up when we click on something, it's all in here laid out for you, how to do it, metrics, all that stuff. It just amazes me. Um, because the point about all this stuff is it's never too late to care about automated test for your application. Of course, the, you know, the sweet spot to do it is the very first time, before you do any other code for your application, you're writing tests. But we all know that's not reality. Uh, the percentage of us who get to work on fresh apps completely from start is like a little teeny tiny metric sized thing, right? Most of us are doing maintenance work or um, altering existing applications. But it's never too late to start thinking about it. So let's say we've decided that we're going to write tests. I kind of look at this and there's three things to look at. Number one, is your code actually ready to test because testable code looks a certain way? Then the second important thing is do you actually understand the testing tools? I mean, sure you've heard about them, PHP unit or PHP spec or BHAT or, you know, or Codeception, whatever one you want to use, but do you actually understand what they're doing and finally, do you understand some of the common testing patterns? I know design patterns are a big thing. I know a lot of developers fall in love with design patterns when they first encounter them, and then their applications look like uh, their, you know, whatever their favorite design pattern was. I mean, most developers use design patterns all the time without realizing it. If you use any kind of modern web framework, you're using the model view controller or model view template, usually, model, and there's some other weird ones. But, you know, you use a lot of them without realizing it. So this is what code most of the time looks like, right? Spaghetti code. I remember there's a very funny anecdote that went on the internet a while ago that, that Rasmus invented uh, PHP when he was looking at a plate of spaghetti. <laughs> uh, so when we talk about code that I think is testable, what do I as an experienced tester like to see? Well, what I like to see is code where dependency injection is being used, that, we, that the application consists of uh, small objects with a small number of methods, and that you're using a bootstrapping sequence that allows for easy overriding. So we're gonna get into that a little bit. So let's talk about dependency injection. Oh, by the way, in case you don't know, I'm the person responsible for the application that this conference used to uh, submit papers. So I'm pretty sure my cheat code, allowing for auto acceptance of my talks, was in there. So um, this is not code from that. This is code from another app. I'm a humongous baseball fan. I guess that's odd, a Canadian who loves baseball instead of hockey. Uh, but this is an example of, you know, and I'm sure this is very typical. This is just some code to paginate uh, a bunch of results uh, for pitching rotations for a baseball league. So when I look at code, I start identifying things for dependencies. You know, if I'm going to test this, what are the parts that I need to worry about? So first of all, I look at this code and I go, oh man, look at all these parameters that I have to put in. I have conditions and fields and all this other stuff. And then down below, I see I, I have this find method. So I look at this and think, oh, okay. Where am I going to come up with these conditions? Where am I going to come up with uh, defining um, these internal methods, right? Uh, this is like probably the number one obstacle to having code that's testable. Uh, most people are writing code, but they're not thinking about it at all. They're just like, okay, I have a method, and I'm going to create a new database connection, and I'm going to grab this thing from over here and pull something out of our globally available um, uh, uh, dependency uh, container, and they just go ahead and do their work, and they don't realize that if anyone ever asks them to write a test, they'll be like, ah, uh, I have no idea. So dependencies are huge. You, spend, uh, you will be spending a lot of time looking at your code and figuring out how to alter those dependencies when you're running a test. So don't lose control, right? Uh, dependencies you can't control means tests you can't write. It's really that simple. And untested code can lead to like really weird bugs and unanticipa unanticipated behavior. When I talk to people, if you want to think about testing at its highest level, what you're trying to do is to confirm that the code you've written at the lowest level is behaving in a way that you are expecting. Because when you put all this effort into uh, writing tests and you refactor your code so you can inject all your dependencies, what you're doing is you're freeing up your brain to like worry about solving really difficult problems, not worrying about how do I create a database and how to do all that stuff. It's like you want to have it. You always want your brain thinking about solving tough problems, not remembering like weird syntax or, or remembering did I, did, I turn, you know, did I start the database server? Are we refreshing the contents just so I can write a test, right? So how can we control dependencies? It requires code written in kind of a certain way. Think of uh, program flow as, as message passing. 
there's a very common message passing architecture called ports and adapters, where it's the idea that your application simply keeps grabbing inputs from somewhere, does some transform to them, and passes it off to somewhere. And then the flow always goes one way. Your data, and we're talking about web applications usually, data starts on the outside, flows through the ports and adapters into the middle of your code, and then comes back out one way to the user, right? If you really think about it as message passing. So to create testable code, you have to start thinking in terms of, yeah, I need to accept an input and return an output. And, and we really start reducing the amount of side effects that we have. And by side effects, I mean where a code, where, you, where a method does something and it alters something somewhere. It could be like writing to a database or writing to a log file, or it inadvertently calls some other code that changes something. Side effects are, are terrible for figuring out tests because it leads to like really weird behavior if you don't understand what the side effects are supposed to be doing. So you want to be refactoring your code to create your required dependencies outside of where they're being used and tested. So this is where dependency stuff comes in. And of course, there's no shame in incremental refactoring. I mean, I had a, a, a nice little chat with, uh, with somebody earlier today. and just saying, like, you can think of the testing thing as like uh, chiropractors versus surgeons, right? A surgeon's going to go in there, cut you wide open, start hacking and slashing and retying things together, and then hopefully stitch you back up, right? And hopefully things work okay. The chiropractor approach is more like, well, I see you're out of alignment a little bit. Let me nudge here and nudge there and get you back in line where you're supposed to go. The refactoring technique I always advocate is just gentle things to your application. You can't go from untestable to testable at like full speed. So you always want to think incremental refactors are good. Slowly adding getters and setters. Add conditional statements around making sure if this thing hasn't been set, then I will create a new one. Over time, you suddenly have a code base that you can actually do some good tests with. So, like I mentioned before, architect your application so the results and dependencies, more importantly, flow through it. Keep your side effects to a minimum. Uh, and by doing it that way, you're giving opportunities for your tests to create doubles of dependencies that need to be in specific states. Um, so let's take a look at this too. This is from, from OpenCFP, actually. So look at all this stuff that we're having to do as part of a setup method uh, for a test. This is crazy, the amount of work that I have to do. And this is actually probably very common. We have, you know, um, OpenCFP is a Silex application, which is like a micro framework built using Symfony components. And it, and it um, uses a big uh, global app application object. So you can see, just to kind of set things up for a test, okay, so I have my application. I have to add uh, database configuration. I have to add uh, a locator for something. Where's my mapper? I have a favorite, I have a talk, I have data. You know, I have to create the mapper. I mean, that's a ton of work. So let's look at, uh, this would be a test, right? I want to test to make sure that my relations are being created correctly. So I need a new date time object and some data and I create a favorite and then I have all these assertions underneath. Um, assertions are the backbones of testing where assertions are basically a statement where you're saying, I'm trying to prove that the following statement um, is, is true. So these assertions, uh, in my workshop yesterday, I, I talked about how there's kind of three assertions uh, that you're going to use all the time. You're, you're going to say, I assert that these two things are equal, I assert that something is true, and I assert that something is false. Of course, there's variations and wrappers around them, but those three will like, cover like 99% of what you need. So in this case, I have this test, and I do four things, right? Four assertions, and this is an actual test that's in there, and it proves that it works. So this is kind of like, you can see, this is all the setup work that I have to do just to do this little test. So we can talk about taming side effects. I'm, I, I talk about side effects as things that happen inside your code and that transfer things elsewhere. Uh, some very common things that you can do to tame those side effects when you're looking at your code and you want to test. We can use in-memory databases using uh, SQLite. We can use in-memory file systems using VFS stream. Uh, and then you can do dependency overloading, which is kind of like monkey patching. Who here does any kind of Ruby work? A few people. Okay, so if you use Ruby, Ruby, Rubyists love their monkey patching, where they're altering things at runtime. Ruby uh, tests generally don't use any dependency injection. They're just like swapping things out. They need a new date time object or an active record implementation or something. They just swap it at runtime. So I go into that a little bit. So let's talk about why I tell people as a pattern to use in-memory databases. Well, number one, it eliminates the side effect of modifying a common database. If you're writing tests that need to talk to a real database, you suddenly have this big overhead that you have to install the database, make sure it's the same version as what you're using in production, because you always want to use the same thing. Someone has to maintain the data sets, so you may end up writing scripts to like suck data out of your production database and put it in for testing. 
Uh, you have to worry, does the database stay up? Uh, and just like, you know, it's like maintaining another server, and maybe you don't mind doing it, but maybe your uh, system ends are like, hell no, I'm not doing that, do it yourself. So it's very easy for those things to get out of sync. And when those things are out of sync, again, you could end up with some really weird um, testing things. And also, by using in-memory databases, uh, you can get much better control over initial data sets by seeding them. And another third thing that's not on this slide that's actually a good thing is that thanks to the way that PHP does things, when your test is done, the uh, database goes away. And again, you don't have to worry about cleanup steps. You don't have to worry about overriding someone else's data. I have seen people that were running tests on uh, writing unit tests and running them uh, against the production database, and that's a nice way to like accidentally delete everything. Not quite on the level of that person I know they talked about earlier who like destroyed their business with a RM minus RF, but you don't want to be modifying production data. So in my tests, you know, because I'm just simply overriding, I'm saying I'm lucky enough to be using an abstraction layer in my code for my database instead of like using the old MySQLi or something like that. We use PDO. I just tell them, hey, let's use SQLite instead, and then my other tools don't care because they know how to use it. Uh, In-memory file systems, a very good tool to use for your tests. Um, great for anything that you need to read or write files. And again, no need to write code to like clean up temporary files that you've created. Uh, like for example, let's say we're creating an application for some stupid reason. We decide we're going to store a bunch of um, MP4 movies. Like I loaded up on my phone before I flew so I wouldn't lose my mind on the plane. Uh, we decide to, we're going to store them on the file system. So we're going to write some code where I need to filter things out. I'm going to read on the file system and look for everything that has an MP4 extension. Believe me, I've seen weirder code making decisions like that. So if I wanted to test this, well, I'm going to need to actually create a bunch of files on the file system somewhere, and then that's prone to errors. Maybe I don't clean up afterwards. Um, then the tests start behaving weirdly. I mean, I've seen it. So we can use... Uh, so I'd write this test, I'm going to get some downloads, I'm going to do this get movies, give it a path where the files are supposed to be, it does a count, you know, I have this directory when it's scanned, I'm doing a bunch of stuff and trying to do a test to verify that, yeah, I have seven movies on here and uh, a bunch of movies on there and a bunch of other files. But if I want to test, like, I don't want to use real files because also what if I want to take this test and eventually get to that holy grail of continuous deployment? I want to run these tests like on Travis CI or have my own build server built with Jenkins. These things have to be portable. I have to be able to move them around. And if I'm writing things to the file system, I might not even have access to the file system on this other server. So I could replace it with VF uh, S stream wrapper. And I just basically tell it, yeah, let's set a root directory. Excuse me. And we're just going to do it in memory. And then I'll do a setup where I create a bunch of fake files in a memory file system. Uh, and then I just do the same thing, right? I create my new downloads object and I say get the movies. So VFS stream, great tool to use when you're trying to do things in memory. Right. Now, I mentioned about kind of architecture. Uh, small objects with few methods, why do I like that? Uh, because solid, solid principles. Who here has heard of solid principles for, for object-oriented stuff? Okay, fair enough. Uh, like I said, software development is not a Jenga game. Uh, people ask me, like, do I prefer solid? The reason why I prefer solid is I feel like the type of objects and code that gets written coming out of it is a lot clearer. Again, you break ideas up into multiple objects, and those will have a small number of methods, and the intent of what's going on becomes much clearer, and they also tend to lead to architectures where testing uh, is so much easier. Right? Like I said, using uh, test-driven development tends to result in a uh, large number of objects with small numbers of methods, uh, single responsibility principle in action is great. And again, your tests suck because your code sucks, right? Really, there are, there, there's good code, there's bad code, all of it's testable, it's just a question of how much work you're gonna put in. So how do I detect smelly code? Because tests are often a great way to tell that your code actually sucks, right? Um, even OpenCFP, as awesome as it is and used by so many conferences, uh, it has its problems. So I can always tell when we have a problem because my tests require a huge number of setup steps just before I can even write the tests, right? Uh, you can also tell when your, your code to set your dependencies fills your editor screen. When you have to scroll down to get to where the actual test is, you might have a problem. And also, it's, can be, tests can be really, your code can be really bad if it's extremely difficult to tell if you're getting your expected results. Um, so let's talk about extensive setup steps. This is kind of one of the side effects of the way our modern web app frameworks work. All these frameworks are front controller frameworks, 
which means all the requests pass through like one index.php file, and then we parse it and we figure out what controller we're going to use and what action method on the controller we're going to use. Uh, so these bootstrapping uh, steps can be really, really complicated. So you have to look at your app from a testing perspective. Do you have really complicated bootstrapping? Do you rely on hard-coded values for configuration options? And how hard is it to swap out dependencies if you want to use uh, uh, in-memory database? How hard is it to tell your app to use that? If you want to um, tell it I'm running in a different environment, that I'm running in a testing environment as opposed to a production, how hard is that to do? So let's talk about extensive setup, right? Again, this is more an artifact of how Silex does things. So look at all this stuff that I'm having to do just before I get to a test, right? First, I have to create an app and tell it that I'm in testing mode. Okay, that's good. I have to create a fake session. There's an awesome uh, Symfony uh, object for creating fake sessions. I need to create a pretend user. I need to fake out our, our authorization system uh, by creating a double. I need to create a fake test. Uh, sorry, a fake um, talk for the system. And I associate that talk with a user. Uh, then I have to create a profile which is like a user but has more extended metadata on it. That's a stupid decision I made early on in OpenCFP and it results in nonsense like this. Then we also have to have our speaker service so we can tell it to find a profile and return this fake thing that I created. Then we just simply pass the service into our big application object and then finally we turn on buffering so that we don't spit out a bunch of HTML into the console when we're running our test and then we run it. And then this is the test. Create our controller, set the application, pass it in, grab our response, verify that somewhere in the response we see our title, you know, our, our title for the test, our title for the user. So for those following along at home, that was 24 lines of setup work for five lines of test. That ratio, quite common, and also a sign that your application is, is doing way too much. Uh, so what's the actual code that we were testing? It's this. We're rendering something using Twig, right? Again, this is a test for this. And again, for those, again, counting along, that's 24 lines of setup, five lines of test for seven lines of code. Or you could add it together and say 29 lines of test for seven lines of code. Uh, testing is code. You will probably end up writing almost as many lines of code uh, for your test as the actual code. But again, this is a sure sign that you look at all this stuff. I wish I could figure out a way to make this easier. Maybe I'll like, extract them into services and create some helpers, but that's a lot of work just to test that. So, but you know, not all smelly code is wrong. Like that's just the way that Silex has chosen to do things. I have a global application object. I have to set a bunch of properties on it just for the thing to work. I mean. That's just a reality. So, some other things that I see people doing. Uh, the people who are in my workshop yesterday will recognize this one. I usually get people as their first introduction to doing test-driven development to do FizzBuzz. So we can look at this and say, this seems to be a very obvious test. For those who don't know the FizzBuzz algorithm, it's the idea that you pass in a collection of integers, uh, you iterate through it. When you see a uh, value of three, you swap it and put in fizz. When you see the value of five, you swap it and put in buzz, and then anything that's uh, divisible by three and five outputs fizz buzz. Um, it's very simple. It actually, to implement it, there's multiple ways you can do it, but it covers kind of the basics of programming. You're doing conditionals and loops, and uh, despite some people's opinions on it, I think that fizz buzz is actually a pretty decent test to give a junior developer just to prove do you actually understand how to do loops and conditional statements because you would be surprised at how many people don't. So we have this one test and then someone says, okay, cool, I've done my case for figuring out that three works properly. And then five. And then does three and five work together? So, okay, so they've written enough tests to kind of prove all the things, but we've done a bunch of duplication. So did you notice how similar all these tests are? I mean, it's kind of obvious, not much changes. So what can we do? It's just like if you find in your code, we talk about don't repeat ourselves, DRY, uh, where you, if you find yourself using common, uh, common code, you find yourself cutting and pasting stuff all over the place. Well, for tests, it's no different. Tests are code. Good code and good 
Habits in your application will lead to good habits in your tests. So we can use the idea, the concept of a data provider. Um, not to bore people, but a data provider is just simply a, a function that returns an array of arrays. And then you change your test to say, uh, I want to use this data provider, add a couple of parameters, and now, instead of a bunch of tests that look like this, where I'm defining expected input and doing an assertion, I now have one test, and if I wanted to get really um, pedantic about things, all I would do is just alter the data provider. So again, you know, good coding habits leads to good tests. So again, just like duplicated code can be bad, duplicated tests can be bad. So what else do I see that I don't like? So let's avoid some of these things in your tests. Um, conditional statements inside your tests. You should never have an if statement inside your test. Anytime you're doing a conditional thing, that's already a sign that you should be doing a separate test. With a few exceptions, you don't want loops on your test. You should, I should never see a while statement inside a test. I should never see a for each, except in a few circumstances where we're like manipulating data because we need to build up a data set. Um, I have cheated and written tests like that, but for the most part, you know, no loops. And also, I see this all the time because people don't understand how test doubles work, uh, that they create a test double of the thing you're testing just so the damn thing works. I've worked at many places where I've heard the same message over and over again. I would be finished if I didn't have to write the damn tests. So. People will cheat. Developers are lazy. Developers are people. They want to go home early. Some of them work just to work instead of work as their life. Um, and I'm definitely not a work for uh, work as life type of person. Uh, so they'll just do whatever it takes to get the thing done. So these are kind of things to look for and things that when you find yourself writing tests to kind of say, I should kind of back off a bit and, and think about what it is I'm trying to do. And so I'm sure I missed your favorite underused technique that is actually just you being lazy. But again, not all these smelly tests are wrong. Uh, sometimes a test is kind of uh, sometimes a test that has conditionals and loops and humongous setup statements are kind of like a warning sign. If you're familiar with the idea of the canary in the coal mine, where the idea was that canaries they make lots of noise and canaries are likely to die from exposure to uh, gases and carbon monoxide at a much lower level than a human should. So they're making all this noise, and then when they keel over, yeah, it's probably a sign all the miners need to get out and get up to the surface, right? So in many ways, really complicated tests are a sign that something's wrong, and not that the developer's going to die as a result of it, but like these are things you should be looking at that and say, I need to refactor this. I need to take a look at this code and figure out why do I have to do so many setup steps. All right, so we've kind of talked about some of the things I like to see inside tests and like you see in code. And more importantly, do you understand the tools? Do you know how to use the testing framework that you've chosen? Are you using it because you read one blog post about it or somebody tweeted that you respect tweeted about it? Uh, are you using it because it's, uh, I only have 10 minutes? All right, we better pick this up. All right, um, we're gonna go through this almost like lightning slide style, all right. Okay, the tools are, these are, people tell me the tools are hard to use. Um, the problem isn't the tools. The problem is unrealistic expectations of the tools. Much like how uh, Sven's awesome talk about uh, Docker containers. Uh, it's just a tool. It's not a, it, like you said, it doesn't solve all your problems. It's not instantly solvable. Um, I remember when I used things like uh, jails in FreeBSD to simulate type of things at a place I worked a long, long time ago. It was the same type of idea. People thought isolated environments, great, nothing's ever going to go wrong. These things are going to stand up. No, no, no. Murphy will find his way to ruin what you're doing. So the problem is unrealistic expectations. Things like PHP unit, PHP spec, they are just tools. Uh, like so many other things, they, uh, they require discipline, right? And tests are code that you're writing to prove that your other code is right. Tests are, tests are, are code, nothing more. I don't have a slide in here, but I'll relate a really quick story. A rare, a rare time that Microsoft and IBM agreed on something. They did a joint study on the value of test-driven development. They gave the same problem to multiple teams. And they said, OK, we want some teams to do whatever they want, some teams to not use tests, and we want some teams to use uh, test-driven development to solve the same problem. So what they found was the teams that used TDD, it took them 15 to 35% longer to solve the problem. But uh, it resulted in 40 to 90% fewer bugs ending up in the final product. But, that, but you have to look at, sure, it's nice to lie to your boss and say, hey, for one extra day a week, we'll have 90% fewer bugs, uh, like I used to. But the, the point is that it's code. It's going to take extra time. You can't expect, you can't expect to like, get into testing, and it will be a hard slog. 
because frankly, I can't go to everybody's place and sit next to them while they're trying to do their test. I would love to. It sure would be, it sure would be working from home. I could travel a lot more, but I can't be there. So you have to kind of learn how to do it yourself. And it will take time. You will make mistakes. You will feel like you are wasting your time. You will have tests that don't, don't seem to have any value, but eventually you will get it right. So let's talk about Grumpy's four steps to test mastery. Number one, like I mentioned before, figure out your dependencies. Number two, step the second, figure out your expected outcome. The best tests are just simply, I have a bunch of input. I know what the expected output is. I run the test. Do these two things match? That's all it is. Write your tests first, like everything already works, and then write through your code until the tests pass. That's it. Four, yeah, four easy steps, says the guy that's been doing it since 2003, right? But really, it's just four steps. Want to learn more about tests? The best place, 100%, to find well-written tests is GitHub. Go look at your favorite uh, framework. Go look at other open source projects. They don't even have to be PHP. Go look, search, look for tests, look for a directory with tests. There will be tests there for any project that cares about quality. Those will be perfect examples of how to do really difficult things in tests. Uh, really, best place ever to find tests. Uh, you can go look at the project that I do there, OpenCFP slash OpenCFP. We have, we have tests. Uh, for those familiar with the uh, cobbler's children syndrome, the guy who writes tests, his applications have 65% test coverage instead of 100. All right. Good thing nobody pays me for OpenCFP. Uh, and also, there are too many, at this point, I think, we're in the 2016, testing things have been around for 40 years. There are too many examples of well-written tests and clear instructions for people to claim ignorance about how to write tests or use the tools to execute them. We have search engines that are, have indexed, I don't know, trillions of pages. I don't know what it is at this point. I, I hate to burst people's bubbles, but there really is no excuse to sit there and say, well, I don't know how to write tests. There are tons and tons of examples on how to do them because it's self-discipline. It's the same thing. I've worked uh, remotely from, uh, from my nice, comfy office for nine years, and it's self-discipline that lets me do that without getting fired, and testing is kind of the same way. Self-discipline is the magic power that makes you virtually unstoppable. How much time, Ben? Have I got like 30 seconds? Okay, cool. We're going good. So how do we handle some of the weird stuff? Uh, test doubles. People call them mocks. Uh, use them when you have a dependency is not that, that is not under your control that needs to be in a specific state. Creating the doubles only when required um, is a good practice. What should we create substitutes for in our tests? Database connections, code that calls third-party third -party APIs, you know, like if you're grabbing uh, tokens from someplace or you have to make a call somewhere. And code that has side effects. By side effects, things like writing things to file systems, writing things to logs, updating, uh, updating database records, stuff like that, right? Want doubles of that. Uh, I'm gonna really rip through this. Database connections, this is probably one of the biggest arguments among testing. Uh, does your unit test really need to make sure the database is working? No, because if your database isn't working, your app's probably screwed already. So I don't believe in using real databases. Right? If your app's down, yeah, you got, if the database's down, you got bigger problems than whether your test passed or not. Uh, the reason to like kind of create doubles and, and control the database better is that you get better control over expected responses, especially the laziness of uh, having shared databases, multiple developers are using them, data sets can get blown away. You want complete control of that. Third, why create doubles for third-party APIs? Well. The API that you're using, it could be restricted, right? You could be rate limited. You could be sandboxed for tests. It could be paid per use. Do you want to explain to your boss why your, you know, your bill from an API provider is uh, 100 times what it normally is because you were learning how to write tests? Probably not. And again, are we in the business of testing their API or are we testing our own code? As an aside, consider the use of contract style tests when you're doing APIs. Uh, I know that APIs are super, super popular. Uh, there's different strategies for writing tests against APIs. Unfortunately, I, I have like, what, a second and a half to talk about? Skip it. Uh, dependencies, re really there. Dependencies that you cannot inject without risky uh, refactoring is weird. Getters and setters, don't really need to test them because again, we're not testing our language's ability to set parameters. Uh, and weird stuff to test is how to verify that specific code has been, um, specific code has been uh, executed. Let's talk about some of this stuff. Like, we look at this thing. Say we have some, to send some incoming message requests. I forget where I grabbed this code from, but you know, we're creating a, a, a Zend HTTP client, and like, how, if we want to test this, how are we going to figure this out? Because this is our problem dependency, right? Thank you, Ben. Um, you should just put up zero up there to make me totally panic. Uh, 
we need to, if we're writing a test for this, we have to figure out how do we pretend to have that client. Uh, you know, what can we do? That's a, a problem thing. We could use something called monkey patching. I explained from the Ruby folks. Uh, there's, there's another tool called Kalan, K-A-H-L-A-N. Basically, it lets you to, like, can override almost anything. The overrides are globally available, so you should probably put annotations and comments around your tests to run them in separate processes. Uh, this is an example of using Mockery, which is my preferred mocking tool that you can overload requests. So I can basically tell it, I don't want you to use the real Zen HTTP request. I'm going to create a fake one, and I want you to use that uh, in your application. Kalan does it the same way, but unfortunately it doesn't integrate with PHP units, so I'm kind of reluctant to, to recommend it because you end up with like a separate set of tests and then you have the habit of problem of, okay, I have to maintain my PHP unit tests and now I have a bunch of Kalan tests. But as you can see, I'm basically creating a, a, fake, um, a fake request object with a bunch of parameters on it and then the code should use it just like it's expecting, right? Mockery is awesome, Kalan is awesome. Uh, having, we're, we're in the stretch here, having to, having tests that, uh, having to test that a non-public method works, uh, uh, of course as in a protected method, is a testing smell. If you've architected your code correctly, you have private and protected methods with no side effects that are called by publicly accessible methods, and if you have correct tests for your publicly accessible methods, you never have to write a test to, to verify that a protected one was there, big time smell. Having to test the contents and or state of a protected attribute inside a class is a test smell as well. You should have getters. Your test should never be looking at a property of a class directly. Verifying code got executed in your tests is easy. Why? Because you can use xDebug. How many people have ever used xDebug? Excellent. Derek is a god for creating that thing. Uh, you can use xDebug to like, help identify code coverage, and I found out in PHP 7, there's a built-in debugger and profile in it that you can use as well. Uh, because I feel like code coverage reports are criminally underused. Code coverage reports can do so much for you. They can tell you what parts of your application actually haven't been tested, but more importantly, from a grumpy developer's perspective, it can show you which methods are way too complicated and need some refactoring. The uh, crap score that xDebug helps spit out uh, is really, really enlightening, and it will make you question your value as a programmer. Okay, I know we covered a lot of stuff, and probably maybe too much for 45 minutes. Um, so we're gonna skip to the shameless self-promotion part. Uh, not only do I speak at a lot of conferences, I write books. So these are my two latest books. Uh, I highly recommend uh, checking them out, of course, because it helps put money into my pocket and makes my wife happy. So I, I wrote a book on like common ways to use uh, PHP unit. And then this is a new book, it is almost done. In fact, I wrote the last chapter while I was in my hotel room after sleeping for 18 hours to fight off the jet lag. Uh, kind of the base minimum information that you need to know how to write tests. A lot of what I talked about in this presentation will be in that book. Uh, luckily, because of the way LeanPub does things, you can uh, purchase the book while it's, in, while it's in progress. I'll be completely honest, these books are $29 a piece. If you think that's expensive, I guarantee you the first time you apply the ideas that you learn in this, you would have either made yourself more than $29 or saved your company a lot more than $29. Uh, ways to get in touch with me. Uh, by email, charches at grumpy-learning.com. I read every single email that makes it through Google spam filters. I respond to every email that I feel is worth responding. I don't get too many people abusing me because some of those people have met me in person at conferences and have reconsidered shit-talking me. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter where I do a lot of performance art as Grumpy Programmer without the U. And in real life, you can actually come up and speak to me. I won't hurt you. Uh, I'll leave this up for a second. This is where you can find the slides, so you can catch the things that I really, really rip through really quick. And uh, the conference has been using Joined In. Joined In is a very good application uh, to help speakers understand whether their talks, uh, were, whether we're getting across the information. Uh, despite my many, many years, I've been speaking at conferences since 2005. Uh, I am always looking for honest feedback on my talks because uh, when people pay ridiculous amounts of money to fly me halfway across the world, I want to make sure that I'm del delivering good info and being useful. So that's it. Thank you very much. All right, so we've got really not a lot of time, but maybe enough time to say three or four questions. Max, if anyone has any questions. They're all intimidated. No, wait, <laughs> no. Someone dares to question me. 
I'm more wondering, too, you talked a lot about unit testing. Have you found static analysis works well with unit testing or any experience with that with PHP? Uh, yes, there are some good static analysis tools. There's things like PHP mess detector um, that are like a good complement for the code coverage reports. And those things are always very enlightening because it, it does the same type of thing. It identifies um, parts of your code that need some work. Uh, there's a PHP copy, um, PHP CPD, it's a cut and paste detector thing that looks at your code and identifies uh, things there that way. What I have hopes for, because I know Zev mentioned this earlier, that now there's abstract uh, syntax trees inside PHP 7, so I'm hoping from a completely uh, selfish side of things that some people will start creating code analysis tools that use the trees, because there's some things you can do a lot easier. I attempted a couple years ago to write a scanner to go through people's code and identify stuff and say, you have too many conditional statements, here's a dependency that you need to pull outside for testing purposes, and tried to get to the point where I could like generate skeletons of PHP unit tests, but then I got bored and said I would make more money writing a book, so I stopped working on it. But, but yes, there are a bunch of them, and I highly recommend them. They're especially effective if you're able to set up like an automated build system, and then as part of that whole thing, even if you're not running tests, at least check out your code, run the scanner through it, and just analyze the output, and it kind of gives you like highly effective, uh, no, it's the wrong word, good points to go and take a look at code and say maybe we need to think about breaking this down into smaller, or we've, we're cutting and pasting something over and over again, we should move that into a utility class. So I just hope that those tools get better now that there's manipulating tokens, PHP tokens, is way harder than manipulating syntax trees. So I'm just hoping I get a chance to fool around with some of those things. Uh, time for maybe one more. We'll do two more. Hey Chris, you talked about code coverage and I'm wondering if you know any tools in in the situation when we write integration or acceptance testing using BHAT or other tools, not PHP unit, do you know any, any tools to, to give information from this point of view? I don't. The only one that I know does it is XDebug in conjunction with PHP unit. I don't know. Because those other tools, like PHP spec and BHAT, their focus isn't really on like overall code coverage. Their focus is on changing from using like that very like assertions and stuff to like human readable test, be had especially with its scenarios, with the given this, and there's a lot of parallels uh, to uh, Deborah's talk about user stories, and like a place that I worked, we had a great success uh, making our product and project managers write our tests for us in that kind of BDD and user story style, and then the developers just learn how to turn that into tests. So roundabout way, uh, no. I, have, I don't know if, if PHP spec or um, or BHAT has any integration with XDebug. I don't think so, because that's not really the thing that they're after. They're more, they're not so concerned about coverage, they're concerned about human readable tests. And that's a good goal. I just, I've been using PHP unit for so long, those other things that just, I'm like, eh, eh, whatever, I'm just not ready to use them. All right, and I know there was one more down there. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the talk, it's very good. Uh, what I found is not hard to sell TDD to developers. But at least once they try, they see the actual win, but I found it's 50-50, where it's for business to actually uh, add these five lines of testing code for 25 lines, it's very hard. So okay, I'll tell you a good strategy for handling this, because I get asked this all the time. Okay, so the idea of doing TDD and writing those tests is that you want to shift the cost of fixing the bugs to the cheapest part of the equation, right? Developer time is usually your cheapest thing. So if you talk about, I'm almost done, go real quick. So if you look at, you, if you look at developer's time, as, uh, if you look at a bug found by a developer as being costing X, right? So you write some code, it gets to the code reviewer. So you've involved another person. That may that, a bug that's found there may cost two times because now you have two people's time involved because you have to circle back and fix it. It gets out of the reviewer, it gets into your um, QA person, right? They find a problem. Well, that might cost actually 5x in terms of resources because now the developer has to stop whatever stupid thing they were working on and fix this bug and then it's got to be reviewed and then it's got to go back to staging. And then maybe it goes into pre-production and someone finds a bug there. That might cost 100 times developer time. Same thing, you got to go back. If a bug makes it through all of that and gets up into production, that could cost you 1,000x. It could be a type of bug that actually destroys your company. So my personal opinion is that only the dumbest of managers will look at this thing in terms of money and say, 
and say, oh no, I don't want the developers, I don't want them writing tests, right? It's like you point out to them, a bug that makes it into production costs way more money to the company than you giving me an extra day a week to write tests. For some people, they will only understand the money thing. I mean, you're right. Most developers, given the opportunity to write do you test? They're like, yeah, I, like, it's a good thing. I get to verify. But for the people that don't do the development work, they just simply don't understand because they've never had to go and do that type of thing. They just say, well, why can't my developers write things without bugs? And I just usually laugh and say, okay, I'm going to go work somewhere else. Right? <laughs> because bugs happen. It's, these are programs written by humans. Programs aren't going to be written by, uh, by uh, computers anytime soon. Uh, I have complete confidence that in my lifetime, uh, AI will not take over and try to kill us all. So... Uh, the money, the monetary argument is the one to make, to point out to them, removing the fixing of bugs from Friday night after the deploy to uh, Tuesday morning, where I've recovered from being pissed off that it's Monday, uh, to fix things. So that was, anybody that's trying to make that argument to the people above them, you have to frame it as a money and resource argument, because otherwise, they're not gonna believe you. Any more, can we do one more? No, I'm all done. All right, thank you very much.